In this series, we are exploring what happens to the eye and vision as we age. In the first video, we looked in some detail at how vision decreases in sharpness and other dimensions, like ability to detect contrast and reduce dark adaptation. With this video, we move on to structural changes that affect vision. In the last videos, we will discuss vision and driving. Sooner or later, every part of the eye changes. Decreasing production of tears leads to dry eyes, clouding of the lens becomes cataract, and retinal deterioration may become macular degeneration. It would be nice if we could divide this into categories of normal aging changes as opposed to disease processes, but it cannot be divided quite that neatly. Cataract is a good example. Everyone gets some degree of color change and clouding of the natural lens over time. We might choose to call it a cataract when it begins to interfere noticeably with vision. So, we will look at aging changes and the diseases that potentially may result. This will take us on a tour through all the structures of the eye. To get you oriented, let us start with a brief review of the structure of the eye. Here in side view, you can see the cornea, the clear window in the front that lets light into the eye. Then there is the iris, the colored structure, that controls how much light gets in. Behind the iris is the lens, like the lens of a camera. The cornea and lens act together to focus light onto the retina in the back of the eye. The retina lines most of the inside of the eye. Like film in a camera, it receives the light and generates nerve impulses which travel along the optic nerve to the brain. Almost everything we are going to talk about is covered in separate videos about specific structures or diseases. For example, the cornea, cataract, or macular degeneration. The first thing light encounters as it hits your eye is the tear film on the surface of the cornea. Usually the tear film has a smooth, even, glassy surface. The tear film is more complicated than you might think. It has a mucus layer on the surface of the cornea, a middle watery layer, and an outer oil layer. The watery part of the tear film is produced by the lacrimal gland located inside the upper outer eye socket. Oil is produced by the meibomian glands located in the eyelids. The fine layer of oil on the surface helps reduce tear evaporation. Over time, the lacrimal gland produces less of the watery part of the tear film, mostly because of hormonal changes, but there can be other reasons, as listed here. That is one cause of dry eye, technically called aqueous deficient dry eye. The other frequent cause is a problem with the oil secreting glands, which allows more aqueous evaporation. This is called evaporative dry eye. Either way, dryness typically causes blurred vision, a feeling like there's sand in the eye, and, if it is bad enough, damage to the cornea. This is a very common ocular surface problem related to age. We described the cornea as the clear window in the front of the eye. It has three layers, starting with an outer epithelial, or skin layer. The middle layer is structural. The inner layer is responsible for pumping fluid out, which is key to keeping the cornea clear. Think of it as bailing out a constantly leaking boat. The shape of the cornea remains fairly stable over time. The two most common corneal issues are, one, effects on the surface from dry eye, as mentioned above, and two, decreased pumping from the inner layer. Decreased pumping means fluid builds up within the cornea and it becomes cloudy, with a significant effect on vision. Pump cells are typically lost, either because of damage done at surgery, like cataract surgery, or a disease called Fuchs dystrophy. If the cornea becomes too cloudy, it can be replaced by a corneal transplant, traditionally done by replacing a full thickness circular section in the center of the cornea. More recent technology has allowed for a transplant of just the endothelial layer, which has significant advantages, advantages for healing and stability. It is an amazing piece of surgery. 
Often, there is a cloudy ring that forms around the peripheral edge of the cornea, called an arcus. People often mistake this corneal clouding for a cataract, but cataract is clouding of the lens inside the eye, while this is in the cornea. The clouding stays peripheral so it doesn't interfere with vision. If it occurs after age 50, the full name is Arcus senilis and has no association with lipid levels or cardiovascular disease. On the other hand, if it occurs under age 50, it is called Arcus juvenalis and may be associated with increased lipids and cardiovascular disease. From the cornea, we move to the junction where the cornea and iris meet. That area is the location of the filtering system, the trabecular meshwork, where fluid exits the eye. Here is the route fluid takes as it circulates inside the eye. Behind the iris, the ciliary body constantly pumps a watery fluid, called aqueous humor, into the eye, which brings oxygen and nutrients the inside parts need to function. It circulates through the pupil, then it reaches and passes through the meshwork, eventually re-entering the bloodstream. The balance of fluid going into the eye and fluid going out keeps the eye inflated with a certain amount of pressure, just like the pressure in a basketball or a tire. The cells that make up the meshwork decrease in number with time, and also there is accumulation of debris effectively, effectively plugging the pores in the meshwork. These two changes make it more difficult for fluid to get out of the eye, and that is why pressure inside the eye tends to increase with age. That structural change causes the most common kind of glaucoma that we describe as open angle. By angle, we are describing the amount of space between the iris and the cornea. An open angle means plenty of room for fluid to access the meshwork. There's another situation in which the iris is pushed forward, typically by advancing cataract, so that it blocks access of aqueous to the meshwork. This is called narrow angle and is a separate mechanism for causing a rise in pressure. This is usually age-related. Both are described in more detail in the glaucoma videos. Next, the iris and pupil. We all know that in low light conditions, the pupil gets larger to allow more light to enter the eye. And in bright light, it constricts to reduce the amount of light getting in. It turns out that age has a significant effect on pupil size. For example, if you look closely in dim light in a young person, the pupils are quite large, while in older people, they tend to be mid-sized, which is as big as they can get. If you measure pupil size and age, in youth there is a big change in size going from dark to light. By middle age that range is decreased, and by later decades there is little pupil movement. That results in less light entering the eye in low light conditions. However, the smaller pupil size also means a greater depth of field, though unfortunately not enough to avoid the need for reading glasses. Speaking of reading glasses, in video 3 we will look at changes in the lens, loss of flexibility which leads to the need for reading glasses, and clouding of the lens called cataract. In video 4 we will look at changes in the vitreous and retina, vitreous changes leading to retinal tear and detachment, and retinal changes preceding macular degeneration. Now that we have mentioned several eye diseases, let us close by looking at what are the chances they will affect us? Causes of low vision, that is, less than 2040, are dominated by cataract, which is generally fixable by a surgery. Causes of blindness, vision of 2200 or less, are dominated by macular degeneration and glaucoma. We will cover all these topics in this series. Here are selected references if you want to read about these things in more detail.